uh, described as the Indian art house icon by the Time magazine, Mr. Rahul Bose started his acting career at the age of six when he played the lead in his school play. Tom, the Piper's son, was his role. He runs an NGO, the foundation, where he works with children from un undeserved areas of India. His second NGO, Heal, works with the survivors of child sexual abuse. He was voted as the Indian Youth Icon of the Year for Social Justice. He was also awarded the Green Globe Award for his work on climate change and NDTV Celebrity Sports Activist of the Year. In 2013, he was awarded the Hakim Khan Sur Award for his work towards national integration. In 2015, he was named GQ's Philanthropist of the Year. Last year, he produced and directed Purna, a biopic on the youngest girl in history to climb the Mount Everest, for which he was felicitated for the ex excellence in direction by the Directors Association of India. He was GQ's Man of the Year, Social Change in 2017. A former international rugby player, Mr. Rahul represented India for 11 years before retiring from the Indian team in 2009. Sir, you truly embody a person with possibility, and we are more than honored to have you here. I request you to now take the center stage. So I just realized I've been here before. I had this reincarnation experience as I was walking down the corridor. I was like, what, what is this? Is it my previous life? And um, uh, I think there was, um, there was a meeting of NGOs here, and I had to speak to all the people from different NGOs about, I think, giving or something like that. But I remember I was sitting somewhere here, and um, I remember this hall very clearly. Right, so um, thank you. Thanks for having me here. I um, was at ISB Mohali last week, and so before I actually start my talk, I know that Saurav is here. I don't know whether anybody else is there from the faculty, Padmini, of course. But um, I was asking the kids at ISB Mohali this question, young adults. And I said, um, do you have a course on climate change affecting, becoming, has become, the greatest determinant of a country's economy? And they said, no. They said it's an elective. And I, I think that that has to change. Because if China doesn't adapt to, doesn't uh, adopt the adaptation and mitigation norms that have been set, in, by 2040, they will have lost 4% out of 8.2. What's China moving at right now? Whatever it is, so they lose 4% of that, 4 percentage points. And India will lose 2.8. 2.8 out of 7. So it's massive, it's everywhere. And if you actually look at how economies are moving, both in the positive and the negative way, you'll see it's because of climate change. Which are the sunrise industries? Which crops are doing well? What happened to agriculture? Untimely rains, time too much of rain when you don't need it. You can't breathe in Delhi. Why is that? And how many human days, it used to be called man days, how many human days are you losing because of that? With your labor, whether your pulmonary problems, what's happening there? He, every single thing, including little things that today seem little, people being killed over water, over a tube well being built, and I'm drawing water, and you know, th these are all true stories, I'm not making these up. Uh, this was in Haryana. There was a murder over a, fighting over a tube well's water. All of this so-called social stuff is now directly impacting the economy. And if I would urge, not that I'm anybody to urge the learned professors and the pedagogy at IIM Bangalore, but I would really urge you guys to have a really very hard look as to if you're discussing business, it just cannot be done without the elephant in the room. Um, anyway, that's just my two bits to start with. Right, um, I, thought, I thought what I'll do today is, um, if you guys, I mean, if the theme is prism of possibilities, I think what's very common for speakers to come and talk about is um, success, is to talk about winning, is to talk about uh, high points, but in my experience, my teachings have, my learnings have only been for my low points. You never actually have a great time at a party and say, oh, I'm going to put this down to experience. 
When you have a crap time, when you failed at something, you're like, okay, I'm gonna put this down to experience. You never actually finish a wonderful vacation with your friends and say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's only when you have a really hard time in the family or there's a crisis and you come out of it and say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I thought I'd talk to you about my three greatest failures, uh, three greatest humiliations, uh, three greatest degradations, three greatest moments of self-doubt, which obviously I climbed out of, otherwise I would have killed myself and I wouldn't be here today. Or if I would, it would have been true reincarnation. Um, so I inhabit three worlds, um, the world of cinema. I've been acting for 26 years now and directed two films. I will be directing a new one in January. Uh, I, I, I haven't counted, but 30, 35 films I've acted in in five different languages, including Kannada, actually, a film called Nirutra. And um, played international rugby for 11 years, which is definitely, uh, by far and away, the most uh, mind-blowing experience of my life. Uh, Played rugby for 36 years, but also played 11 other sports in school like all of us do, who are you know, blessed with some kind of natural athletic ability. And I uh, run two NGOs. One is called HEAL, Help Eradicate Abuse Through Learning, which is about prevention of uh, child sexual abuse, as well as healing those who have been abused, and the foundation which works with not children from uh, undeserved parts of the country, but underserved parts of the country. I we think we need to do, we need to put a hyphen there, otherwise it's very difficult for someone to not say undeserved as opposed to underserved and they're completely different. Like, they go to undeserved parts of the country. Really? Like, you know, which parts of this country just don't deserve it where these guys go? Uh, but it's not uh, Sharanya's fault, it's ours. We should put a hyphen there. So, what I thought I'd do is uh, ask Aishwarya how much time do I have before the Q&A? Where is she? So it's 1.17. When do you want me to stop? 1.40. 1.40, and then, and then 2 o'clock we close, right? So we'll do a 20-minute Q&A, because we should hear from everybody. Cool. So I thought I'd I've picked one seminal challenge slash near failure slash humiliation from the world of cinema, from the world of international rugby, and from the world of NGOs. And all of them are lessons unique to me, but I'm sure they'll resonate with you somewhere. Let me start with cinema. The first film I ever did was when I was 26 years old. I had been working, working in advertising and doing theater in the evenings. It was an English film and, does anybody act here on stage? Anybody done theater act, stage acting? Right, this is I am Bangalore, I forgot. Right, so um, it's very different from cinema acting. Fundamentally, which all of you will understand, there's no audience. So you don't have the affirmation of uh, an audience's uh, response to tell you that it's going a bit thanda today versus, uh, yes, I have them. Today, it's, today it's, it's looking good. Second is, Obviously, on stage, everything is done sequentially. So, you know, it's a timeline that runs straight up. Whereas in cinema, you know, one day you're doing scene 26, the next day you're doing scene 91, the third day you're doing scene 25, which was the scene before scene 26. So you have to connect that. So basically, you're arcing your performance every day from one to scene 99, and then picking which point on the arc you have to perform on that day. Difficult to do only made easier and can only be really, really, really foolproof if you have somebody on the other end as invested in the project as you, namely the director, who is arcing it for you also. Think, yeah, mm, you, your 26 was a little bit higher, so 25, you've got to pitch it up a little bit. It's too low right now, etc., etc. For reasons I won't go into here, that didn't happen. I got little to no 
encouragement, feedback, advice, criticism from the other end. So basically, I was uh, driving at night with my eyes blindfolded in the middle of a snowstorm with black cloth on the windscreen. So compounded with this, this film was being shot in a place called Narsipatnam, which I think is in today's Andhra. And at the time, Narsipatnam, 26 years ago, was a tiny, small, village-ish town. And I was staying in a place where the hoteliers obviously understood that location, location, location was the most important part of uh, someone's magnificent stay for two months. So they had located the hotel right next to the busiest uh, petrol pump in the country, where cars, trucks, uh, buses with musical horns would come and fill petrol uh, all night till about 3 o'clock in the morning. And just on the other side, location, 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 they had chosen to also make sure that the world's most popular temple, or so it seemed to me, was on just the other side of this um, long, thin building. And uh, that temple, the bells would start ringing at 3.30. So you had 29 minutes of uh, dreamless, deep, silent sleep. The rest of it was challenging. Um, also in that place, the deep generosity of that area, whether you ordered upma or varai or whether you ordered a dosa, you would get a, um, a bowl of sand free. And hospitality being, as you know, we are so famous for our hospitality, they wouldn't give you the sand free, they would put it in the dosa, in the varai, in the upma, so that you didn't have to mix it yourself. So I think I must have ingested in those two months more silicon than a supermodel, but... Um, <laughs> But I say this not to denigrate the good residents of Narsipatnam and the catering facilities and the accommodation facilities of that place 26 years ago. I say this only to tell you that even the side windows of this car were fogging up. And I was pressing the accelerator slightly, but it was hurtling somewhere else. There was no respite not in your food, not in your sleep, you're sleep deprived, you're irritable, and you're being ignored on the other end, which of course was the unkindest cut of all. And so every day I used to go back to my hotel room and I should just say to myself, how did it feel? How did it feel? And I would say it, it felt okay. In effect, what I was doing was I was drawing on all the experiences that I'd had as an actor on stage. I was drawing on all the experiences I'd had as an actor on stage, looking at the way audience responds. After doing a take, I would look and see if somebody had become engrossed in the take that I was doing. I was basically picking from all the various parts of my experience to tell me how, how it feels, to inform me how it feels. But I had no clue whether it was right or wrong. Film finished, shooting was over. It took about 10 or 11 months for, for post-production. I get a call one day saying that the film has been selected for the Toronto International Film Festival. In those, anyone play tennis here? I'm, come on guys, somebody. Do something, ah, tennis, yes. So the grand slam of tennis is Wimbledon, US Open, French, Australian. So there's a grand slam of festivals, which is Cannes, Venice, Berlin, and Toronto. So getting into Toronto was a big deal. It was a big deal, and so I was like, Okay, great, I'll come. They've invited you, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I'd love to come, but I haven't seen the film. And they're like, oh, don't worry, you can see it there. <laughs> so there I am in Toronto on a blustery cold September evening, 
sitting inside famous players theater it's that's the name of the theater uh double the audience how many of you here 200 four this is 400 well then one and a half times this so 600 people in that theater hall and watching my film for the first time in my life my first film and you know that time when you have that you don't you're so tense there's acid boiling in your stomach you're not hungry you know you're not thirsty you, you just don't know what you are you're you're just unhappy and you're tense and you're coiled up and I was sitting there just random like one of you just sitting in the audience and I watched each scene go by and obviously I wasn't watching the film I was watching myself I was like okay yeah that's okay mm, minor injuries fine yeah and the film finished and I was sweating bullets it felt like I'd run a marathon. And I was like, Phew. I think it's a four and a half, five on 10. Pass to ho jaunga main. It's okay. And then the director was called on stage. Not a round stage, but a stage very much like this. I said, uh, the, the host of, you know, they have these programmer, programmers. It said, um, before we take any question answers, uh, no, I'd like to invite the director of the, of the film. So he comes on stage. He says, before I take any question and answers, I'd like to join me on stage uh, in the lead role, uh, an actor from um, Bombay, Rahul Bose. And he called me on stage. I got onto stage and everybody stood up. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. They'd never seen me before. Everybody stood up and started clapping. Now, I have seen standing ovations in various fora. Sometimes someone totters up to get a Lifetime Achievement Award, and the people in the front row stand up because they have to. This person can see them. <laughs> oh. now, although this person's eyesight is very suspect, but can see the front row at least, so these people stand up. And the people in the second row feel that, you know, we're also in the VIP section, so we should also stand up. And then third row guys get irritated, like, come on, I can't see it. What the hell? So they stand up. Then the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And by the time the 14th row has stood up to say, kya ho raha yaar? let's just get up, the first row has sat down. <laughs> so I've seen standing ovations that are grudging, that are polite. But this was neither. It was just boom. And that is the time. And for all of you, if you have not had them, I pray you do. But in a moment of great, great, great sweetness, victory, vindication, positivity, a great win for you, you'll find that you enjoy it best alone. Even if you're in the middle of a party, at some point you'll walk out and just inhale the feeling of being victorious alone. And I was doing that, and I thought to myself, the life lesson here is, there will be not one, many times in your life when you will not get the right feedback. There will be many times in life when you will not be guided properly. There will be many times in life when you will be expected to do it. Excuse me, that's your problem, not mine and you will not have the capability to do it. But you, at that time, will have only one person to draw on who will always be by your side, and that's you. And the sum total of all the experiences as a father, as a son, as a mother, as a daughter, as a hockey player, as a cheater in exams, all your experiences you will be pulling from to deliver what you've been expected to deliver without any external help. And so for me, the life lesson was when all else fails, dig deep, look in. You might be wrong. You might have arced it wrong. It's a fluke that I got it right. And some people might still disagree. But at least if you fail then, you will say, I did my best from every single fiber, muscle, and synapse in my brain that I could offer. And that in itself was what 
what I learned from that from that from that particular incident. Right, well, it's not clapworthy. It's just a thing. It's just. Um, but thank you. I under, I appreciate the sentiment. Um, the second big challenge I want to talk to you about is from the world of NGOs. So, does anybody remember when the tsunami hit Indonesia, the Andamans, Nagapatnam, Kadlur, uh, Sri Lanka, Boxing Day, December 26, 2000, and I was watching television. I don't know how many of you are old enough to have been allowed to watch television in those days, but 27th, 26th, 27th, 28th, and all the stories were coming out of Kadlur and Nagapatnam and Sri Lanka and some from Indonesia, nothing from the Andamans. I didn't know anything about the Andamans. I don't think more than 10 of you will probably know that there are 37 islands occupied out of a 576 island archipelago, that the total population of the Andamans is less than Kolaba, five and a half lakhs, that out of which 35,000, 40,000 are tribals, not tribal tribals, look like you and me, but the real tribal tribals are not more than five to 6,000. Or that people from Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Bengal, Andhra, Telangana, and Punjab, Sardars, Sikh farmers in Punjab have settled there. They didn't know any of this. I just turned to my sister and said, what's happening in the Andamans? She's like, maybe not much. I mean, maybe there's nobody there. Maybe that's, there's no story. There's no human devastation. I said, don't be ridiculous. You know, I know a little bit enough to know that there are human beings there, there are Indians there, but what's going on? So completely, completely out of a moment of a moment I'm very proud of, but a moment of deepest insanity, I said, I'm going there. She said, what do you mean you're going to go there? I said, I'm just going to go there and, and, and do something. At the time, there was a big Bollywood star who was making a lot of waves about how much help he was going to extend to Kadlur. And PowerPoint presentations, shots on television of him making PowerPoint presentations to the DC and the collector and the DM and talking about how he's going to change the face of this place and rehabilitate Kadlur and, and shots of him sweating as he took relief packages out of trucks and gave them to the poor, needy people of India, etc., etc. were going on. No one was in the Andamans. So I spoke to my network of NGOs that I knew. By that time, I had become decently active. I didn't have my own NGOs, but I'd become decently active in you know, the areas of gender justice, communal harmony, and children's education. And they said that uh, at last count, there were about 104 NGOs working in Nagapatnam and Kadlur. And it's easy to understand why. 250 bucks, get onto a train, hang RAC, Get there with your team and start working. And that's brilliant. That's the way it should be. But to get to the Andamans, you had to spend 50,000 rupees. You had to fly. You had to stay somewhere. So we formed a coalition of NGOs that said, we will raise the money. You be our eyes and ears on the ground. Get to the Andamans. Tell us exactly what's needed. Because it's too much of this, let's give blankets. At 45 degrees centigrade, you don't need blankets. In fact, after a natural disaster, do you know what the people need first? Hmm, yeah, what is obvious? Digging tools to bury the dead. Mosquito nets. Because once you have stagnant water everywhere, it becomes a massive problem. Of course, baby powder and rice and dal and water, all of that taken for granted. So anyway. 30th of December, I arrive at the Andamans with the famous writer Amitav Ghosh, who's a dear friend of mine. I said, Amitav, I'm going, and I don't want to go alone. He said, I'd love to come because he's a climate change wonk, and he said, I'm going to write about this and talk about this and things, so it'll be great. If you're going, that's fantastic. And I reached there. And I'm fast forwarding to getting to the relief commissioner's office, who looks at me and says, ah, oh, Mr. Bose, come. By the way, he's still in the civil service. Uh, ah, Mr. Bose, come, come. He's not in the Andamans anymore. So I came and sat down. Sit, sit, sit. So why have you come here? I said, well, I'm representing uh, 20 NGOs. Uh, we are called the Solidarity Network. They're going to raise money. And I'm here basically to be the eyes and ears on the ground to find out what is needed. 
He said, uh, no, you're coming here. You're coming here for your own publicity, that I know. Now, uh, where, where's the TV interview and you want to take your photographs? Take them and go away. I said, actually, no. I'm, no. So he was referring to the other uh, Bollywood actor who had promised so much and by then had disappeared. So I said, actually, I'm just here to actually see what's going on. He said, no, no, you don't have to go anywhere. If you're saying that you haven't come for publicity, take out a pen and paper and then write down, I'll tell you what to get. I said, meaning? I will tell you what is needed. You write it down, make three copies, submit one to the lieutenant governor's office, submit one to this office and keep one and put dates under every single thing you've undertaken to bring and then we will hold you to that. So I said, I, I just can't do that unless I know what is needed. I'm telling you what is needed. You write down. I said, have you been to the, 30, at the time it was 36 islands, not 37, which were inhabited. I said, have you been to 36 islands? He said, I don't need to go. I'm the relief commissioner. I know what is needed. You write it down. So I said, oh, excuse me, I, I think I should leave because you know, I, it, this is not what the network has sent me here to do. So looked at me, fine. I went out, went back. Amitav said to me, he said, let's just leave. There's so much of pain in this country. There's, you don't have to wait for a natural disaster. If you want to help, there's so many places you can go and dedicate your whole life to that area. So it's OK, just, just leave this place. Now he knows me better, so of course I didn't. And I went to that man's bosses, 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 boss. In a huge office in Delhi. And I named this person by name. I said, told the whole story and I said, he's anti-human. Because if anybody wants to help anybody in this world, and it's help that that person will need because that person is articulating what he or she needs, then there's no reason to stop that. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be done in an organized fashion, I get it, but there's, it's just anti-human. So he was transferred in three months. And has anyone seen a photograph of me in the Andamans? It's been four, 14 years now. Any interview? Any photograph? So I ended up making 30 trips in 30 months uh, after December 2004. And uh, then I started my own NGO, the foundation, which looks at developing underserved areas of the country by selecting their kids and giving them a 17 years of education from the uh, age of 11 to 28 outside, and then they go back. And so the first batch we chose was from the Andamans. And today I can extremely proudly say that uh, the first architect and design major in the history of the Andamans is from Srishti in Bangalore. And she's a Nicobari tribal girl who'll be, who's already begun to work for a label called Nicobar. And she will uh, very soon, in a couple of years, go back to Nicobar and work at the regeneration of two villages that come out with handicrafts. So that's one of the stories that's come out of this entire. Yeah, this applause I'll take. This applause I'll take. So the life lesson from here is that if you are setting out to do something that is palpably good, that is palpably moral, that is palpably correct, that will make the world an infinitesimally better place, and someone tries to block you, you have to go over her boss's, 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 boss's head. And you will all be working in hierarchical structures don't be quick to say, oh, this is not happening, I must go there. It's only when you know that you're being blocked for all the wrong reasons that you just, then I say, hang the rules, hang the hierarchies, break everything and go to a place where you'll be listened to. And if that doesn't work, then I would suggest you just move on and get to go to some other space. I would have moved on and gone to you know, another part of the country. Yeah, so that was life lesson number two from the world of NGOs. Uh, the third one is the toughest. The third one is uh, very, um, very difficult to talk about. It's from the world of international rugby. So I represented India from 1998 when India played its ever, first ever test match in Singapore in October. And I retired in 
In 2008, I announced my retirement at a triangular that was going to happen in the Philippines. Philippines, India, and I think it was Malaysia, I'm not sure. We played the first game, which was against Malaysia or Thailand. And the second game, and my, therefore my last test match for India, after 10 years of playing rugby for India, was the game versus Philippines. Rugby Union is a game played with 15 people on one side and 15 on the other. And there are seven substitutes, numbering from 16 to 22. And very much like football, the substitutes are very important in rugby. In fact, even more so because there are injuries, there are blood injuries, there are, you know. So the substitutes become very, very important in rugby. So by, by 2008, I'm not one of the 15 best players in India. I am from 16 to 22, I'm one of the reserves. And typically, I'm substituted in at about, there are 40 minutes a half. I'm typically brought in between minutes 60 and 65 and I play 15 to 20 minutes till the end. That's fine. It's exactly what my merit deserves, and I'm happy with that. So this is my last test match, and we're winning. We're beating the Philippines, so it's not even like it's a pressure situation where sometimes you want to play your front 15 for the whole game because you don't want to lose. You don't want to risk bringing in somebody who is good, but maybe not as good as the top 15. Minute 60 comes by, no, minute 50 comes by, and the coach asks me to start warming up. My number is 18. Although it's by position, I'm putting it simplistically, but 16 would go in at 60, 60th minute, 17 would go in at the 64th minute, 18 would go in at the 67th minute, etc., etc., till 22nd, 22nd player would probably go on by the 75th minute. And I'm warming up, minute 60, 16 is brought in, goes onto the field, substituted. Minute 64, he pulls up 17, 17 gets on the field. Minute 68, he pulls on 19 onto the field. I'm still warming up. Minute 72, 20 gets onto the field. Minute 75, 21 gets onto the field. Minute 78, 22 gets on the field. There are four minutes of extra time. I'm still warming up. A minute 84, the game is called. And I'm just sitting there. It's like when someone hits your head with a very large stone and there's that ringing sound of you. I just don't know what the hell happened. And the boys are coming off the field, joyous, celebrating. They've won. And they suddenly see me and they're like, Boos, what happened? Why? I'm the only guy in a, clean, in, a, in, a, in a clean kit. Everybody's dirty. And they suddenly realize something has gone very wrong. So they just walk off and on the team bus, everybody's celebrating, but there's this dark hole of despair sitting in the front near the window, trying to vanish. I'm trying to be invisible because I don't want to mess up that feeling at the end of a tournament, you know, which is all about triumph. Even if you've lost, it's all about talking because for seven days you don't talk. You train five hours a day and you're too exhausted to talk. And at the end of it, it's just a catharsis. Just everybody lets it out. On a hotel, you don't want to be on a hotel floor of a rugby team. Normally, there's just this madness. People running naked, someone slapping a towel on somebody else, jokes being cracked, somebody's singing, somebody's throwing food at somebody else. It's just mad. And I go up to that floor and I just go straight to the room. I change out of the kit, which is clean. I change into normal clothes and I have a shower change. And I just walk down. Go to the concierge and say, uh, where's the nearest bar? <coughs> and he says, well, uh, I mean, there's a bar across. So I said, no, no, somewhere a little distance away in a hotel. He said, yeah, the Shangri-La is close by, so it has a nice bar. I said, thank you. 
It's early. You know, rugby games are played, if you're not playing under lights, they're played at four, especially in uh, the Philippines. So by five, we're done. By six, we're in the hotel. So it must have been 6.30, 7 o'clock. And I begin to drink. I only drink beer, so I start at 7. And I drink steadily till 12. And I'm not drunk. And by this time, normally, I'd be in a coma. And the f messages begin to come. Boss, where are you? All of us have had dinner. We are going to this club. Don't be silly. Come on, man. Forget about it. It's our last tour together ever. Come on, join us, etc., etc., etc. And finally, I say, fine. So I go. And the coach is there with the boys. So I'm pretty hammered by now. But in any case, even if I was sober, I would have asked him. I said, why? What was that about? And he gave me the most violent answer that I've ever received from anybody in my life. He said nothing. He just looked at me. And that was the time, 14 beers down, that I decided I was not going to retire from the Indian rugby team. I went back to Bombay hired my own conditioning coach, rehired my strength and fitness coach, got a sprinting coach in, it was the off season, we had played our last tournament, and began to train. At the time I was 41, I began to train, and I trained for three months, and all the boys knew because, you know, everybody comes to the Bombay Gym Khanna Club and plays, and so that was training there. And um, the next triangular was in Singapore in 2009, the coach had changed, the camp was held, the first selection was held uh, for the top 60 with fitness parameters. I made the top 60, then what is called the yo-yo test, it's, there's, a, there's a bleep test and a yo-yo test, are slightly different. So we did the bleep test, made the top 30, then we had the cutoff for 22, the 22 that will actually train to be in the, as part of the Indian team, made the 22. There was a fitness test for the 22. I ranked 11th. And then I retired in 2009 in Singapore. I didn't make the 22. I made the front 15. I made the front 15 and I played. I think that this is the most important lesson and actually the clearest lesson that a child gets in school when they were not talking and the guy next to you was talking, but the teacher picks on you, but the guy next to you keeps quiet and doesn't confess that it was me who was talking, is that actually, you're alone. If you have any illusions that there are people with you, forget it. You're alone in this world. Barring your parents, and if you're very close to a sibling, and I know some people who aren't, you're alone. You have to, have to be your own engine. There will be times in your life when it's palpably unfair. It's unjust. The world is ranged against you. None of this is fair. The only way to combat that is to make such a strong case for yourself the next time that you shame the world into selecting you. That's how overwhelming the case you have to make for yourself. So even the people who hate you, who are trying their best to keep you out, just won't be able to. So those were the three uh, life lessons I thought I'd share with you. I've gone nine minutes past my time. So without any further fuss, should I swing it out to, please, you don't have to ask a question. You can just comment, debate, disagree share a personal life experience as long as it's within the next 11 minutes. And um, yeah, let's talk. You just stick your hand up and I'll see you. Yeah, please. The first part is I'm not sir, I'm Rahul. Now tell me the second and third part. Uh, have you have you ever received the answer like uh, you, when you asked why and the answer that you received was silence? So till this uh, this date, has it ever been updated to something? 
No, there's no 2.0 on this one. All right. It's uh, very much. I, I never asked again. Because it, it, it was a vile. Look, the guy was an ex India player. He was jealous that every time Indian rugby is talked about, why is Rahul Bose talked about when he's the 18th best player in the country? Why can't it be the more important players? And I totally. But it's not my fault, man. You don't take it out on me. You can take it out on the celebrity system of cinema and stars, and we can get into a serious debate about that. But at that point of time, you've got to be a coach. You gotta, you gotta play your team. So, like, the only reason that the next time you like uh, made a that hell of a progress. So, do you think that you account each and everything to just one, uh, to just uh, the simple fact that uh, he didn't give you an answer? Of like, course, I would have retired otherwise. All right. Definitely, I was ready to go. I was 41. Who stays on playing 41, hanging on by your fingernails and a walking stick? You know, but um, uh, that, that just you know redoubled my efforts, and I wanted to make sure that. I wasn't just a also ran, but I was very much a part of the front 15. So I killed myself to do that. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. But it, post that, next time around, bring it on. You know what I mean? Uh, a girl, a lady, a woman. Yes. Uh, so, let's say in the next five years, I'm going to set up a palliative care center. And can you tell me what would be the possible challenges for a social entrepreneur then? No. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a palliative care center. What the hell would I know about that? Okay. I mean, uh, I, I, really? And if I did know, it would take me about half an hour to think about it before I gave you an answer. Uh, seriously. I, I honestly can't tell you. But what I can tell you is what I've learned and what I've shared with you in this room right now. But if you want a serious answer, then I, I'll take time to think about I it. I mean, it doesn't specifically have to be a palliative care center. Just as a social entrepreneur, what do you think we'll have to prep ourselves for? The most important thing I can tell you if you're doing anything in the field of social entrepreneurship, helping people, trying to make the world a more compassionate, uh, less angry, more fruitful place, is, which is completely the opposite of what any organization will tell you. And I would urge you to always under-promise and over-deliver. Every organization, everybody teaches you to over-promise. Just promise more than you can actually do because in the hope that you'll get there. And we do it every day. Yeah, darling, no, no, no. I'm at Kemp's Corner. I'm, I'll be there in 10 minutes. But the movie's starting in 15 minutes. I'll be there in 10 minutes. You're going to get there in half an hour. You know that. Why do you do that? Because you want to be thought of well. Human beings like to be thought of positively, which is why we overpromise. But in the social sector, when you tell a bunch of hungry, homeless people after a tsunami that there'll be a helicopter that'll arrive at 12 o'clock tomorrow and you know, there'll be packets of dal and chawal that will be thrown uh, on this football field in Nicobar, and the chopper doesn't turn up, then the next time you say that there'll be a chopper coming, fewer people come. Because some hearts have been broken. Some people have been disappointed. And so I think if you under-promise and over-deliver in the social sector, it has a fantastic effect. Because people are like, wow, this is, you know, they're, they're, it reaffirms their faith in humanity. We'll take one more question, or I'll take one more question. You, would you like to? Okay. okay. <laughs> this use of the, you know, yes. Yes, please. I, I definitely will. So now <laughs> decide. So like you said that you got the most violent answer from your coach. But because of that answer, you didn't retire and you got into the best 15. So probably you must have been thankful for his criticism. So are you still in touch with that coach? Oh, ha. <laughs> no, I'm not thankful for that. The one thing that all of us dread is being humiliated in public. I did a film called I Am, where I play a homosexual who is uh, forced to fillet a cop uh, because he's caught making out with somebody else and the cop forces him to fillet him. And that, that sense of humiliation, public humiliation that I went through for that role, it's just a horrible feeling. It's a horrible feeling to, to go to that space. And it's what all of us, our nightmares are about. I, I was walking out with no clothes on. That's it. The idea of being publicly humiliated. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I don't thank him, but am I in touch with him? You know what? Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're around in, the, in a larger circle, and 
if you're drinking and we're having a beer and he's part of that circle, it's fine. Um, I think also when I played for Singapore, when I played against Singapore and I made the front 15, I think it kind of slayed all ghosts and hatred I had towards him. And I think for him, it just must have killed him. Uh, last one, last one. A man from this side. Yes. Uh, one of your biggest fans after watching Jain Kohli ki main Kohli. My condolences. Uh, uh, sir, uh, what is your biggest inspiration in the in, in, in the times where you're completely depressed? Like you, you were not selected in the top 15. So what was your biggest inspiration right from your childhood to till date? Dude, I've just spoken for 54 minutes about this. <laughs> uh, who's the inspirational character? I'm no. just asking about. No, nobody. 